Trollord Games. Join the fray! Is there audio now? Are we live? Are we are we alive? Yeah. Are you <laughs> Oh, I thought you said... I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> Who are you talking to? Oh. Oh, I get it. I get it now. I can hear you loud and clear. Night five. Are we live, guys? It's Discord. I got on the Skype and video conference Skype, and it was no problem. It's Discord. We mostly do everything via Skype. I think we've done. Couple of games Discord, but um, it's definitely Discord. I was just on Skype less thirty seconds ago. No fun. They just don't like me. Are we live, everybody? Can they see me? Hey, are they talking? Are we getting feedback online? Oh, cool. Oh. Okay. Damn. Damn. Well, why? <laughs> Let's see. Time Lord's wife says that loading usually means the camera's trying to share permissions or something. Right, it's going to be Skype. Good call. Let's see all that. Thank you, Time Lord's wife. I think it was sure that turned on. <laughs> Is it live? All right. We at least got that. So what I'll have to do is sit very still and and talk behind my hand. So. <laughs> Good Lord and mercy. Yeah, it's got to be just for a dude because Skype was working just. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm trying to get this set up. So, yeah. All right, does anyone out there before we dive in have an idea why my Discord would be so laggy? Hey, Davis? Yeah. Are you? Move. Can you move? <laughs> All right, we're live on Twitch. I know you can't see anything. No. <laughs> I can see you and Chuck. And I can't get into the Twitch thing, so you're going to have to read the questions to me or something if there's any questions or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Good heavens, Mara. Yeah, I got Uh-oh, It's your bit right, Kent. You <laughs> rolled a deep one. Now you're clear. It oh, but you might move around. You're laggy still, but I don't really care. No, I'm a little bit laggy, too. <laughs> you're wavy. It can't take two troll lords at the same time. Dude, that's how we should do the world building on our foreheads. We should, like, just take a picture of our forehead. <laughs> and all the little ridges and bumps would be, like, the mountain things and stuff. Like then you get in the hairs and that's a forest. How do I leave the, oh, you mean leave the Twitch channel? Leave the what? The Discord channel? Can you? Okay, all right. Just go back. away. Can anyone hear us? Dude, how oh. do I leave the channel? I didn't know that anyone can hear us. Chuck, can you hear me? Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> how do I, how do, hold on, Davis. How do I leave a channel? There's a button. Am I supposed to be doing something? <laughs> All right. I'm back. Excellent. Excellent. We should we should have we should have logged on at like three o'clock last night and started messing. Does, does this have an automatic bleeping thing? No. Uh, let's see. Okay, can can everybody? So my audio is still cutting in and out. So. It's probably cut. What do you have? AT and T. Yes. There. There's your reason. We just got that. Is the audio better? I just changed something. Is the audio better out there? Davis is no. very clear audio, etc. Just enunciate well <laughs> and speak slowly. Real slowly. <laughs> How's that? Is that better? 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 Okay, so what I'm doing is maybe no difference whatsoever.
Uh, yeah, if he, I'm doing input sensitivity in Discord. Uh, oh. Well, it's got to be Skype. I mean, it's got to be Discord because Skype is working just fine. Each serves it. Okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> but before my patient patience runs out, we just <laughs> we need to pull. All right, so we are very late for Jim's trick to the trade. Nothing unusual. We'll just have to dive into it beyond what we normally, you know, normally we must talk about movies. So, <laughs> so we'll have to break out of that. For those of you who don't know, Davis Chenault is joining me today. Uh, and Davis, of course, uh, is my brother. Uh, we started playing Dungeons and Dragons together back in 1975 or six or some crap. I can't remember. You actually had a pretty good. Uh, we'll have to, we're going to do this one of these days. I didn't, I didn't know how it all began, but you you were explaining that to me this weekend how you got the books and didn't want to play it for a while. We kept playing the Avalon yeah. Hill games. <laughs> yeah, we were playing chit games, and we were wondering why this game didn't have chits and what you do with a game without chits. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're, one of these days. We're, we're gonna do a, a whole origins origins thing, but um, uh, yeah. So Davis and I started gaming way back when, and we've been world building and all kinds of you know whatever jamming forever in a day. Uh, so and Davis, of course, is the co-creator of the Castles of Crusades, the Siege Engine, and all of that stuff. Creator of Enzea, the world of Enzea, uh, and a mountain of stuff that we're we're working on now. Not least of which is the NPC Almanac, which should be out soon and came in at twice the size as it was supposed to. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> I'm almost done with the name thing. And they do, I got about a hundred names to write and I'm done. And that's it. You're finished. Yeah, the, the, the book of names, he's done with the, the NPC Almanac and the book of names is all he's got left. And it's actually, he created this really cool tool that's, if I remember correctly, it's going to have 100,000 combinations or some crazy shit like that. And like, yeah. Something like, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's different for each one. Uh, they're, all, they're all a little different. I actually went overboard on the orc names because I like orcs so much that the orcs have really complex naming systems. Good. <laughs> no, go ahead. You got it handy, Davis? Uh, yeah, let me look for it. <laughs> Shitty. Shitty. <laughs> you can't see the, the comments, Davis, but someone says it sounds chitty. <laughs> yeah, so orc names consist of one, two, or three elements. The first element is typically a one-syllable word. This word may or may not have any meaning. It could simply be some guttural utterance or related to an adjective or noun. This might or might not be followed by a second element. Many average orcs would only have a single element for name, but leaders or important orcs would have two elements. The second element is usually a two-syllable sound, but can be a single-syllable sound. As before, it may, not, may or may not have a meaning. The third element is not really a name so much as an affiliative identifier indicating what tribe, troop, or organization or other to which the orc belongs. They would only be used when necessary or if they desire. There is no distinction between male and females. So, yeah, and then there's a hundred first elements and a hundred second elements and a hundred third elements, a hundred nouns. So, if you pull them all together, uh, it's, it's close to 300,000 combinations. <laughs> It's a lot of combinations. <laughs> what gave you a heart attack? Oh. Wad Pitak. Tarmelkur. Kunvor. Igsfor. The Atrocious. You can go on for a while. Uh, These yeah, were fun to write. But the whole thing, and we, we kind of approach it differently. It's not just a book of names like everyone does. What is it? Norse names, English names, whatever. It's we, we're doing for orcs, gnomes, uh, goblins, hobgoblins, yeah, humans, dwarves, the whole thing. So it's going to actually be an extraordinarily useful tool, I think. Yeah, uh, we only have like a we only have a small section on humans, uh, and we focus on the other names because all those other book of names, it's like. 
I think most people can come up with the human names. Although we're going to do an expanded book at some point, I think, right? Yeah, at, at some point down the line, when we, when we clear the shoot of all of this debris. Like five years from now. Yes, we're, if I find one more item in the warden that we haven't printed, I'm going to burn something to the ground. <laughs> I don't know what yet, but something's going to be burned. But that gives you guys a good idea of so Davis has been world building forever in a day. Uh, and I, I probably didn't, he picked it up way long, way before I did. I picked it up somewhere in the mid eighties. Uh, but Davis early, early, early on, I, I think one of my favorite stories is, is the T-Rex story. I've told on here an innumerable number of times where we were running, it was probably basic D&D. I'm not sure which one it was. And I had a Vorpal blade and Davis uh, rolled a Tyrannosaurus Rex attacked me and I decapitated it with a natural 20. And I can remember his face to this day. <laughs> it's not a news at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that moment, yeah, yeah. That moment yeah. began integrating a, a more realistic approach to gaming from, from Davis's side of the screen, which, of course, spilled into my world building when I began it a few years after that. So I, was, I thought uh, today would be a good day. Hold on, Chuck. I thought today would be a good day to bring Davis in and we can talk about just some of the basics. Not about tone and all that bullshit, but some of the basics, nuts and bolts of world building and starting a campaign. You want Chuck? I was just going to say, before the stream's over with, if he has time, I would love to hear about how Enze came about at some point as a world he built. But that's okay, if you got time. I don't know if you do or not, but... <laughs> That's a, that's a stream all in of itself. And okay. One of the things we're, we're going to start doing is getting Davis in here and discussing his side of things because a good a third, if not half, of the material we got out there has got Davis's footprint on it on one way or the other. Okay, okay wait, wait a, a second. second. Stop. Stop. I just I had, had like, like a thought. thought. All right. All right. So, so I'm looking, I'm looking over your notes. notes. So, what, so we're what we're supposed, supposed to discuss to... is climate, biome, ecology, monster ecology, population, and political structure. Yes, we'll get to that stuff. But it occurred to me. Wait. So I have more of a uh, a top down approach to to world building rather than a. Uh, a bottom up. So, so well, I no, no, that's really sort of complex because I always ha I have the mythology in place first, okay, mythology so this, and language in place first. This is exactly why I wanted to bring you on today because I approach it a little bit differently than you. I, I start from you know when I run a game, I'll start from that nugget of where it begins, uh, and then I kind of build around it, and I got to have a climate, a biome, and all of that stuff. So you you clearly approach from the other end. You start it with. The big picture stuff. Yeah, mine always begins with why it's there. You know, and it starts with some deity. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. And then it rolls down to uh, language to set the tone. And then I'll go into the ecology and the biome. But I, I suppose that's a top-down approach. And then the, the bottom-up approach, yeah, I just, I, you know, I did that for a while, but I can't, it never made sense to me. You, you probably did Probably because you killed my T-Rex with a dang sword, <laughs> <laughs> which is just impossible. You can't do that. That wouldn't happen. Vorpal sword or not, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> It, it, but that's that's actually part of what you know. I've been seeing a lot of this stuff all over the place. It's just weird to me, I'm both on Twitch and TikTok and Facebook, wherever the hell people are getting together. That people have this idea that there's one way to do this, which clearly there's not. <laughs> it, it clearly there's so many approaches that you can take to, to running a role playing game that it's mind boggling. Yeah, there's no, there's simply no set way. And you know the other thing too about this whole world building thing is that people get locked up in, uh, in reality too much. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm horrible about that. 
but guilty of that. Yes, I'm very guilty of that. But I also, you know, I got to be cognizant of, and everyone should be cognizant of. You're living in a fantasy world where gods exist, where gods walk and they create worlds and they create universes and stuff like that. There's literally anything. Rivers can flow up through the sky. I mean, everything is simply possible. Everything. And if you and open you it up to that, 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 but then you have to ground it, it, otherwise there's a break, break, I think, a mental break, break somewhere break. in the game. Each surf just said, uh, you know, he, he, he starts from the ground up. And that's one reason I start from the ground up, because when you're, if you're just starting out and you're building a, a, a campaign, a game, whatever the hell, uh, all of that all stuff, stuff, the esoteric religious stuff, the mythologies and all that stuff is going to play into it a little bit, the cleric of the paladin, but at the end of the day, they got to know what's in the woods and what's beyond the tree line and the monsters and whatnot um, just to get started. And now, obviously, if you take the top, top-down top approach that Davis does, it takes more prep at the beginning. But I don't really remember that much prep on it. Say, I, you may have done a lot before you started running that vodka campaign that I wasn't aware of. But even then, I, I kind of felt like you were creating it as you went into something. There, well, there's, there's always something because I have a more sandbox, sandbox approach. I just have pieces in place. Yeah. But, but, but so I didn't, I didn't know, know exactly what you're going to I mean, you guys could have gone, gone anywhere and there were encounters in my head ready, ready for every direction. direction. Uh, uh, and you just chose, you chose one. one. No, it well, doesn't really take that much prep. prep. Except, I, I mean, I will say that prior to. It just makes more sense to me. It's easier for me if I know why everything is there. Rather than exactly what's there, I know why it's there. And then I can just throw the elements in at the end, you know, because I know where everything is and why it's there, and then I just throw the elements in as necessary. Right. Uh, but no, you need to, yeah, no. Maybe I should focus on ground up more. <laughs> well, I, I think it's all legitimate one way or the other, but I do want to jump into... So let's just jump in whether we go, whether you go from ground up or top bottom, however you want to do it. Um, and let, let's jump into the, to the actual trip to the trade. Uh, and the first one that we were going to talk about was climate and bio. Uh, and basically, basically what we're saying is if you, when you start your game or wherever it is, whatever, wherever the world's already kind of created in your head or whatnot, you're going to need climate biomes. You're going to need to know where people are coming from and where they're going to the terrain that's around them, and the weather, and that's essentially what all of that is. Yeah, and uh, I guess we cover a lot of that in the, in the CKG, okay. but you can get tons of information on the web as well. Wikipedia has a really good setup where they discuss all the biomes, <laughs> and there's yeah, a CKG, lot. We, we plunge into this in the CKG uh, in a huge way, because Biomes are listed, all the climates are listed, and they're cross-referenced so you can know which biome exists in which climate. Um, myself, I like, I think you, you told me today, Davis, you like boreal forests. That's like uh, uh, pine cone, pine trees and whatnot. Yeah, for boreal forests up in northern, like northern Finland, northern Russia, that area, uh, I guess northern Canada to some extent, the Rockies, the upper north Rockies up through Canada, and... Uh, those karst tropical environments are freaking gorgeous. I see how temperate. And this is, and what we were basically saying today in the first trick of the trade was pick a climate, pick a biome that you're comfortable with, that you're at least vaguely familiar with, or that excites you. And for Davis, it's boreal forest. For me, it's temperate forest. But, you know, yours might be desert. It might be underground. It could be aquatic. It could be any number of things. Oceanic islands, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but find a biome that you're comfortable with start setting up your game in that biome, you know, however you, however you want it to start. You at least now have an idea of what flora, fauna is going to be there, what the weather patterns are going to be like, uh, and that gives you your starting point for descriptions and what's just the normal natural in habitats that they're going to encounter as they plunge on. Plunge on. i got to tell you, this camera lag is driving me nuts. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely driving me nuts. Uh, I can't concentrate with this craziness on. You know why I like Boreal Forest? It's because I used to play World of Warcraft when it was just one of those little games, and it was all in the Boreal Forest, you know? Before it became the big, big thing that it is now. 
It's like, you know, the big stuff is cool, but I love that old World of Warcraft game. That thing. You played it constantly, but I played it quite a bit. It was... I forgot it was it was pine trees in that. <laughs> I think they've re-released it. I don't really know. You probably I can't remember. Yeah. Somewhere, I would guess. Somehow. Willie the Rat is from Canada, and he says, Amen, Davis. I live at the ed edge of the Canadian Shield. Boreal AF. <laughs> <laughs> I there love you go. that stuff. <laughs> if I ever escape, it's going to be up there. <laughs> yeah, can you tell where they're getting feedback on sound again? Can you tell where that's coming from? This is pissing me off. I can't hear you, Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, no one can hear you. Come on, Chuck. <laughs> 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 Having hiked in the boreal forests of northern Sweden, almost Lapland, gives one of the appreciation of such a biome. That's tabletop Santa. Uh, yeah, actually, I don't think I've ever been in a boreal forest. Uh, I know you traveled all over northern Europe, Davis. Did you go into one? In Europe? Anywhere, I mean. Yeah, I've been up yeah, to northern Canada, just south of the border of Alaska, too. And all up in the Rockies, one of my favorite places is uh, in Canada. It's Banff, and north of Banff. National Park. Then I went up through Edmonton. It's the first time I saw a wolf, wolf pack walking on a street. It was out, not not near Edmonton, but it was west of Edmonton, towards the Rockies. <laughs> I was like, I thought at first I thought they were coyotes because I'd never seen a wolf in the wild before, and I was like, oh no, those are wolves. <laughs> Very exciting. But I think the trees are beautiful. The trees are absolutely gorgeous. Snows and there. also, in see, this is the thing about picking your biome. For me, it brings out uh, certain elements in my mind, and it also fits my mythology. It fits the mood and everything like that. So there are other, you know, you pick another biome, like a desert biome, Egypt, for example, uh, and you have the Great Pyramids, and that evokes a, or brings out that certain feeling, whatever you're comfortable with or excited by. Yeah, I but mean, then that, there's that, that, hey, because if it can inspire you, then it's going to help you in your descriptions and setting everything up and getting, and because you're going to be into it, so your players are going to be more likely to get it. Right. See, and then there are certain environments that are difficult to work with, like the steps, where it's 1,000 miles of grass. <laughs> yeah, Monster and Cat, I actually like, I like to run games on the planes, but they're actually very difficult because you can see so very far. And oh, yeah, no, you can see. Yeah, so, you know, it just creates a whole different, not quite as bad as the ocean or seagoing adventures, but it creates a whole different kind of approach that you have to take as a, as a GM. And that is why I think it's important that you pick, at the beginning, minimally, you pick a biome that, is, that you're comfortable with and that you can get into so that your game at least starts, you know, easily. And at that point, once you've kind of picked a biome, it lends itself to GM Strix of trade number two, which is your ecology. And by this, I'm meaning the, the flora and the fauna that you're going to run into. Um, getting a handle on this before your game begins, and it, does, it, it shouldn't take, you know, but a couple of minutes. Like David said, a quick, quick research on the, either in the CKG or... Um, Grass. Uh, yeah, like little like badgers and foxes and squirrels and boars and stuff like that. Uh, what you would normally encounter in those areas: wild horses, camels, whatever, whatever it may be. Monkeys, yeah, vicious, it, it, mean monkeys that it, attack it, you when you challenge them. What you had when you were in Bant and you ran or wherever you had Edmonton and you ran into a pack of wolves on the street. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, are, yeah. You can set that. That's pretty. You should be able to set that pretty quickly. And only a few of those animals, honestly. There's only a few that you even really need to worry about. Other, they're just background noise, or you know, they create the ambiance. Because no animal out in the wild is going to attack anyone other than like a wolf, a bear, a boar, a snake. Actually, there's a lot. Come to think of it. <laughs> It's really vicious monkeys. <laughs> Adam Cole says the vicious monkeys. Yeah, that's, 
And, but the thing is, what you don't want to do, and this is where... I've been attacked by a monkey. Believe me, this little bitty monkey attacked me. <laughs> and he almost won. Damn it. Alright, this, <laughs> this is about to send me out deep in. No more, no more Discord, Chuck. We're done with this thing. <laughs> We're going to switch to... <laughs> this is about, about setting me up the event. Anyways, uh, so what you don't want to do when you're running this your this this second trick of the trade, uh, when you're picking your ecology, you don't want to be in uh, you know a boreal forest and run into some cacti. When you're describing the, the forest, and here's some sudden cactus or an alligator or what have you, because that's going to stand out so much to your to at least one, if not all, of your players, and it's going to you know. They're going to respond, or they're going to have a, a some kind of comment to make, usually a joke, some kind of sarcasm, and that tends to derail you from whatever you're doing. So dive into your biome, uh, figure out what's there, just get a good idea of it, uh, and roll and roll with that. It's it breaks that suspension of disbelief. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the here's one here's an example of a broken suspension of disbelief. Steve is running a game, and Sarah's in the game. Remember Sarah, and she's. Oh, you know, Sarah. I mean, she's a, uh, what is she, biology major, waterways. Biologist. Yes. And Kent used the word sludge or muck? Muck. It was, it was muck. muck. And she looked at you and said, that's not muck. <laughs> that can't that be, can't be muck. <laughs> yeah, and we're like, what? She goes, that's not what muck is. <laughs> Like, okay. <laughs> but anyway, I doubt you'll run into that. That was one of the more hilarious ones. You're right, though. It broke the suspension of disbelief, and you're kind of all derailed. I certainly was derailed the whole <laughs> the whole next 30 minutes was a mess as I was trying to demuckify my river or what have you. Uh, yeah, you just we already went over the T-Rexes and horrible sports at the beginning of the thing. Hey, I want to give a shout-out to Chuck. Chuck. Chuck, you're doing a great job trying to keep this running, but... Uh, you, <laughs> you know the sound system over here is all got one way or the other. Hey, I can send your speaker back. No, I've got, and I've had this forever in a day. I've got a, um, what do they call them, Chuck? This anchor thing, whatever the hell. It's not plugged into the computer per se. It goes through, it doesn't go through the computer sound system. It goes through. Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, <laughs> Everything, so. <laughs> Get the scotch tape off of it. <laughs> hey, you know, I'll be I, I'm very proud of Todd today. The binder broke again uh, for the umpteenth billionth time. You know, it's getting pretty, it, it's, it's got a lot of books on it. And so we, we dissembled the thing again, and uh, I was on with tech support because it was doing something we, we had never seen before. Uh, and Todd got in there while I was on with tech support, and I was talking to some really slow-talking fellow that was trying to help us, but just real slow-talking. And uh, Todd, Todd figured it out. He found a little stripped uh, bolt, and we got some tight, a new bolt, and fixed it. Our new nut, and fixed it, so binder was back on. So uh, I think you should throw it away. <laughs> everything around Not here. Not Todd, the binder. <laughs> everything around here is, is getting to its last legs. <laughs> so... Believe me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> anyway. All right, so let's plunge on to number three. So now this one, Davis, this is right up in your in, in your bailiwick because it's it's not ecology but monster ecology. Uh, creating, giving your monsters more depth than it's given in most game books. Most game books give you, you know, the statistics and then a little bit about the monster hither and yon. But you might want to give your monster a little bit more, whether it's, you know, political uh, structures for your humanoids, hunting habits, whatever. It's just something to kind of give uh, a little bit more depth to what you're playing. And I specifically I remember an encounter, Davis, that you ran where we, were, we slew a troll uh, and then the troll's mate came not actually to avenge us, but to get a piece of that troll take it back to her den so that it could regenerate and her mate could return. I remember that it, it created a huge argument at the table as to whether we should hunt these trolls down and kill them. But 
what, what, <laughs> because that seemed to be an act of evil by many of our players, about half of our players. Um, yes, it that, created a moral quandary. It did. <laughs> But that moral poetry created some great role playing and a huge and, and a very memorable session. It was all built around taking a monster's ecology and expanding it beyond what's on the printed page uh, in in most monster books. Now, I, I my book Monsters and Treasures of Erdan. I know your monsters and Enzea all have some ecology built into them, so that the GMs have that to run with. But uh, doing what yeah. you did with trolls is a good idea. Yeah, you should give your, like, especially the humanoids, you have to give them some depth. And once you do give them some depth, other than just like, a, what are they called? Just things, they're experience pools, right? So you remove them from the experience pool and put them into the, uh, you know, a different, just a different way of view of them. Give them some depth and your characters, the players will have more fun eventually. They can still kill them, but... Yeah, uh, I mean, they'll just have more fun because it's more immersive. Just like when uh, Tolkien names the goblins, gives them Shagrat, I think is one of them. Yeah. Uh, there's four or five goblins or orcs that he gives names to. It immediately creates a whole world. Orcs have names. They're just not like these freaking creatures that are just there for background noise. They're actually individuals. And that sort of creates a... Uh, I mean, it, it'll do it. It'll work. Believe me. It'll work. Give your orcs names, you know, every once in a while or something like that. Right. Anytime you do any of that, and it doesn't have to be a huge amount, just a little bit, no. of, just a little bit of depth to whatever monster it is, whether it's a manticore or a troll or a humanoid or whatever the hell it is, give it a little bit of depth so that, uh, you, you know, one, you can build off of it, but the players can build off of it, too. They Suddenly the world, they, it's easier to stay in that suspension of disbelief if it's if it has more depth. And when you hear Shagrat's name, you, you don't, I don't think you would consciously think it, but you're somewhere in the back of your head, you're thinking, well, someone named Shagrat. So right. is there a family? How do they live? What do they eat for breakfast? <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Uh, these are living creatures that have their own reactions to everything. Can you imagine Sauron's logistical nightmare of beating all those orcs? It, it, I can't, especially in Gorgoroth where there's no water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all they have is volcanic ash to eat, and I guess hobbits if they catch them every once in a while. But just the logistics of that would have been difficult. I don't I think talking... South, but in the the Gorgoroth, or Gorgoroth, whatever it was called, I think there's only that one little trickle of water that Sam found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe orcs don't need water. Who knows? Anyway. Yeah, knows. Well, if you're going to do that, they'll build that into it. Maybe they don't. No, and then roll. Yeah, no, that's true. That's it. Yeah, no. I mean, because there are creatures in, in obviously in the monsters that don't need water at all. They don't even need food. Right. I mean, they just exist to exist to exist. They exist as experience pools. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's funny you should say that. I ran an encounter not long ago where they fought a monster that didn't it didn't need to eat. It, there was eating wasn't the reason it was killing them. It was an evil creature that killed because it was evil. It had no other ulterior motives other than just pure evil, and that was built into the ecology of the monster. Uh, so it doesn't need a yeah. monster. it doesn't need a di digestive system. It doesn't need any of that. If it's not going to eat, it doesn't need it. If it exists because it's magical, you know. Yeah. So. Whatever it is, build that into your monsters and it'll give it a little bit, a little bit more uh, oomph to it. I see, Eat to Serve says the players don't even have to understand the names, and they just have to know that they have different names. Yeah, that's, that's spot on. Uh, yeah, no, different. yeah. And like, everyone always, they're always like listening at the door or something like that, or, you know, they hear them talking, blah, blah, blah. If, like, you're conveying the conversation to the player... I mean, how often do we speak to one another and use each other's names? So they would too. So every once in a while, just drop a name in there. Give something a name. Because they would all have names, you know? Right. Uh, name your dragons especially, something like that. But even the small stuff, give them names. And another thing on those monsters, two points I want to make. One is like for the big monsters. They should be really super, super rare. rare. I know that like uh, it's common to encounter like... There's a Medusa around every corner or something like that. 
but for me, I'm like, yeah, no, there's like a dungeon with three Medusas in it. I'm like, what? <laughs> but I think if you also take certain monsters and make them really, really unique, where they don't exist in every dungeon or you run into them all over the place, you know, whatever, but you set aside a creature like a Medusa, and that's it. That's the only right. one that's out there. And you make it a little bit more powerful, you know, or you slow your character's advancement up. And then that encounter has something super special to it. And you say, well, there's not enough monsters. Believe me. <laughs> there's enough monsters to do that. And, and the other thing is, so, like with the so small Hey, Tabletop Santa wanted to know, so can he name it Orc 1, Orc 2, Grip Orc, Sound Orc? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many orcs, they probably have like literally something like that, you know, they're like um one or one two, one two. Just like in the army. You're number one, you're number two. We uh, see each assert says we talk about that stuff in monster talk, what happened in a game that made this DM create something or another about a monster. Uh Lou Pinata Buffer <laughs> says, a good tip about listening at the door. I'll have to think about uh, fleshing out the idea of exactly what you can hear at the door. But that actually is a really cool idea. I hadn't really thought about that myself, too. Instead of just saying you hear something, you hear... No, it's what... The, it's, it. Yeah, it's yeah. what they hear that's really, really important. And they may not... Like, if, you know, whoever's... Like, if I'm listening to the door and someone's speaking German, I'm obviously not going to understand anything unless they say beer or something like that. But, you know, uh, if I'm listening to the door and someone's back there speaking English... I want to know what they're saying. Now, 90% of the time, what people say is completely pointless and useless. So I'm sure that with orcs, it would be 99.9% .9 of the time. <laughs> but nevertheless, you could throw... Like, here's one I did. I don't know. No, I did one encounter that pissed you guys off. But I remember one where the, the orcs were making jokes. They were making jokes about hobbits and dwarves. And y'all didn't go in the room and slaughter the orcs. You just listened as I had to come up with jokes about hobbits and dwarves. And you guys ignored the room and went on because you didn't want to kill them because they were joking around. I was like, what? <laughs> God, man. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so you can do stuff like that. And it just adds that, you know, it's a layer of depth, I guess. But to each their own. Uh, the one thing that I would suggest you stay away from in the monster ecology is the manticore in the 10 by 10 room. <laughs> Just steer away from that one. Yeah, that's actually, I think, one of the reasons I've got so few dungeons is because I can't imagine why monsters would be there. <laughs> what, what, what do you get out of living in the back of a dungeon if you're an aerial predator? What the hell? What's yeah, I know, I know. I don't, yeah, no, it's just... What do you get out of living in a dungeon, period? I mean, how many creatures would actually crawl into a hole in the ground and just, like, stay there? Can you imagine how difficult it would be just to get food and then yeah, water? It's absolutely nuts. You and know, then go to the bathroom? We've both been splunking, and when you're down in those deep caves, there's nothing but mud, water, and rocks. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's... Yeah, I guess some things would like it, but whatever. Yeah, you know, anyway. there's that Special about that dude living in the Ozarks up in your neck of the woods, and he was living in caves. So there's one dude. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> Statler says it's muck. Yes, there's muck. I don't think there's muck in caves, Statler. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to to get corrected. So the fourth trick of the trade, and as usual, we're running out of time, but the fourth trick of the trade is, and this one's a very uh, special one to me, or very poignant, whatever the flipping word is, uh, is populations. Uh, establishing a baseline population for your area so that it's not, it's not too crowded or it's not crowded enough. Uh, frequently you run into settings that have so many people, you know, 60,000 people living in a city with no agricultural base and the whole, you, you really, if you're going to have that many people, you're going to have so many little villages and outcroppings, there's not going to be much wilderness around it. Uh, and conversely, if you've got no people, then you, you know, it's almost all wilderness and danger. So, coming to some kind of understanding of what you want as a GM, your population to be. Here's your, here's your baseline to work with. Now, we're, and realize this was America in 18, I think it was 18, in 1870. Nine out of 10 Americans were producing agricultural products. 
it takes at least nine people to support one person in a city who's not in the agricultural thing, pre-industrial revolution or agricultural revolution, really. Uh, that only switched in America. It started switches in the late 1800s and into the, I think it was in the 1950s before it was 50% who lived in the city. So you better realize that the vast majority of people are just cropping the land, farming the land to feed the other lazy bums in the city. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I heard and just this morning, I read in the news what it is today. It's 1% of the population of the United States feeds the rest. Yeah, now it's completely flip flop. The agricultural flip-flop. revolution has flip flopped the whole thing. And wait yeah. till those one percent figure out their anyway. They won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can hold it over everyone. Well, you you still got a couple of chickens, so you can you can at least eat eggs for a while. <laughs> yeah. If the snakes don't get them first. No, anyway. no. You've had a chicken apocalypse up there. There's there's no doubt about it. So get yourself a baseline population and run with that. And the last thing, and obviously uh, we've run out of a little bit of time here, but political structures, figure out where you want, when you're setting up your game, when you, when you launch your game, what kind of, it just have, and again, you don't have to have all of this stuff written in stone because you're going to develop this as the game unfolds and as you, and you begin to build your world, but where you're starting and where you're playing the game, decide what kind of political structure you want. Feudalism is my favorite. I think, Davis, you do a lot of city-states. Uh, yeah, I like city-states. Yeah, stuff like that. So, you know, Venice, I guess that would be the Italian, medieval Italian. Yeah. Or you the German, though. Um, yeah, tabletop Santa seconds the independent city state. So just figure out what kind of, uh, you know, uh, Mac Muddle says Izorn lives. <laughs> he made it to second level. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Figure out what kind of political system you want so whenever your characters start doing something a little bit beyond the adventure at hand, running into authorities or a patrol on the road or having to deal with the mayor or whatever it is, you've got some kind of idea of what kind of government or governing body or lack thereof. It could be a complete anarchical system uh, that your characters are going to encounter and that you can kind of hack through. How's it going, Grand Lunter? Chuck, will you... Yeah, I like you- I like city states because you have more, uh, you can do a lot more in a small space and you have a lot more interactions, violent interactions and stuff like that, or confrontational interactions, I should say, between in really localized areas. And That's cities, my preference. Yeah, but cities have this kind of, it's like for you, well, for anyone really, I think it's like the boreal forest. There's this darkness with it. You know, in the medieval yes. period, there's not going to be street lights, there's not going to be all of that stuff. So everything is kind of dark and, and just kind of grounded down. Yeah, I actually, speaking of dark, I have to say, so I was looking up political structures and uh, reading about punishments for treason because I was going to incorporate it in my setting, and I decided not to. After reading about the tortures that they use for treasonous individuals, <laughs> it was enough to make me put the book... It was a, it was harsh, and it was enough to make me put the book down and say, "I can't read this right now." <laughs> I mean, it was brutal. Anyway, the world before the modern era was something else. It it definitely was something else. Yes, I will tell you, there was a game in the Middle Ages. I was thinking it was played in northern France, and it may have been in England. I can't remember exactly where. And this was the game. You get a cat, all right? You tie the cat's tail to a pole, and then you rile the cat up a lot. You just rile it up. And then anyone who's brave enough has to go in and beat with their hands tied behind their back. They have to go beat the cat to death with their head. And whoever could do it won the game. What the name is that? (laughs) Okay, that's just the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> they were they were very bored in the Middle Ages. <laughs> I don't know. It's cr- it's crazy reading about some of those crimes, punishment, and entertainments that occurred. I'm sure there were nice things like they would skip yeah. rocks and stuff like that yeah. too. But eat, eat to surf says that is that is that what a polecat is? 
<laughs> that may exactly be the origin of it. Oh, man. <laughs> mean as a polecat. <laughs> that's not an old world game. We played that in the caves of Michigan growing up. <laughs> <laughs> There you Can you go. imagine doing that though? And that's where your cat gets d6 hit points and one to five damage and rakes your eyes out and crap like that. <laughs> Couldn't imagine going and fighting a cat and you come you come home blind from a game. And you're like, oh, I killed the cat. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Didn't dad put someone's eye out with corn cobwebs? <laughs> yeah, that, I guess you get bored. You got to do something. You got to do something. Green Luther says that's being added to my game this fall. <laughs> there you go. GM's tricks of the trade, how to torture a cat. We don't, we don't advocate that at all. <laughs> yes, please. That was just, it's just a historical, uh, it's a, <laughs> it's a window into the past. <laughs> we like cats. They're very cute. <laughs> oh, oh, you can do it with rabbits. Man, rabbits are awesome. Yeah, but uh, rabbits? Yeah. They're vicious beasts. <laughs> Kids were all young and had them watch Watership Down. That was a horrible idea. <laughs> yeah. Rabbits Steve, are pretty brutal to their own kind, though. I'm setting up a giveaway for us, okay? Okay, just going to do a giveaway. <laughs> That's a color, Lucy Macabre. That'd be a fun game of porcupines. <laughs> there you go. Beat the porcupine to death with your head. <laughs> a great idea. That's an awesome idea. That could be an orcs game. There you go. I'm taking a note. <laughs> Alright, so we're doing some kind of giveaway today. I don't know what it is. And as Chuck's gearing that up, of course, we're going to wind down here in just a few minutes. Uh, and what, despite the many technical difficulties that we seem to be emanating from my system today, uh, we're going to get all this worked out and get Davis on here regularly. Uh, for those, again, for those of you joining us late, and if you haven't, please give us a follow. But Davis has been running games for 7,000 years, and I learned under him, uh, playing under him from 75 until I started DMing in about 80 or 79 or whatever. Then I always continue to play in Davis's games. He's actually my favorite DM, GM, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, you know, Davis, I advocate your game all the time, but I tell people it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Bring your index cards. Five characters piece. <laughs> it's a lot of very real world death in your game. <laughs> very, very yeah, real. I don't know why. Not a lot of people like it at the end of the day, though, is a funny thing. You know, but... it, it, takes, it takes a certain... I think people like it once they kind of get their head around it. Um, but it does... It, it's different than a high fantasy game. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't... I won't say people don't like it. I will say they can only take it in spurts like three or four months and then they want to break you really you have to, to sit at your table and this is and this is one reason that i enjoyed it so much because it it plays into my style of play when i'm actually playing to sit at your table you really have to give up the idea of treasure and experience because it's not really what it's about it's really about achieving whatever goal is in front of you uh, which can be difficult or, or hard or if i'm doing it i make it more difficult than it should be <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because I can never stop. <laughs> yeah, there's not like, yeah, just to give an example, there's not like, I'm always getting stuff back, not so much anymore, but Steve will send a, a thing back and say, you have to put some treasure in here. Like the other day when I posted on Facebook that my treasure was a bag of dried beans. <laughs> I'm serious. That's my treasure. <laughs> That's what you get from this encounter <laughs> a bag of dried beans. That's it. Okay, Steve, I'm going to put it out here. We're going to give this away to everybody. So, Oh, very cool. Well, I was going to until it started being well, ignorant. Uh, We're taking it back. Uh, that's stupid Twitch. There we go. All right. What are we, what are we giving Tell them to read that right there. I don't think they can hear me. But. Uh, today's giveaway is the Coda to expansion, the Inverons of Austrag. That'll be a good one. That's a, that's a brutal environment right there, the Grausum Land Swamp, as you hack your way through to get to actual Outstrap. Uh, inhospitable. Oh, that's the swamp area? Yeah, that giant, you know, the causeway goes across it. I think it's 80 miles or some such business. Oh, uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Willie wanted to know, were they magical beans? What? Your treasure, your dried beans, were they magical? <laughs> no, they were black-eyed peas. <laughs> 
Yeah, that, I'm gonna get that, 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 that game that Matt was talking about, his or lives, that was in Davis's game. And Mike, I lost three characters in that. Chris lost one, Todd lost one, Sarah lost one. I can't remember if Laura survived or not. Uh, but I, I was on my third character, and I think he got killed as well. So. <laughs> yeah, all your characters died. Yeah. And okay, and to show you how how okay, because that was a good game. That was a really good game. The most the most memorable games I've ever played. Yeah, and uh, I enjoyed running that game more than probably other than the Kang games and stuff like that. I probably enjoyed running that game more. And I can't, I can't remember. I remember when Sarah quit. quit. Because she got mad because of the priest. And yes. Claire, she got she got mad because she wouldn't obey her church. <laughs> and she had been warned. Before she sat down at the table. Uh, and my second character died trying to save his wife. Remember the goblins came over the... Yeah. Prefix, and I didn't want her sold into slavery, so I killed her and stood over her body and then fought till... But I wouldn't leave because she was dead, so I wouldn't leave. I could have escaped when my back knocked down the wall, but I just stood there and fought so that they couldn't even, you know, whatever. So me and my wife died there on the, <laughs> in the courtyard. But you forgot the one other thing that you did in that game. You had a son. You put the son down in the well. That's right. I forgot about that. The son survives. And that was supposed to be your character 20 years later. Dude, we should pick that back up. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a fun pickup because he survives the whole thing. The goblins don't care about anything that's burning crap down. Oh. Uh, and then they leave, and he crawls out and survives. That's cool. And I figured that would be a great character pickup later on in the game. Oh, that's cool. And that's the thing about your games, because they have this edge, and this is kind of plays into the whole thing we're talking about today. It has this edge of believability, realism, uh, and it doesn't go so far, that because it's still a fantasy game. It's still all of the, the magic and the monsters are all there. There's this believable side to it that when you're in it, if you survive... You 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 feel like you you're you're in something you're in I don't know a movie or whatever that. All right, the code is not working, Chuck. It's as Statler said it worked. Who uh, it's this is just a, a troll lord day is all this is <laughs> from start to finish. Todd got in there, he had 500 books to bind. He got in there and he got I don't know like 40 of them bound and he came out and I can tell his face. I've known Todd for 30 years. Something was amiss, so there went the binder. The printer was acting up. Now my camera's acting up. Code's not working. <laughs> it's a troll lord world. I'd fire that binder. Maybe that binder is. I go in there and I talk to that binder. I pet that binder. That binder has worked so well for so long, and I know now I've taken it apart so many times that I know how to kind of reassemble it and. What we're going to do, I don't know if this will work, but a lot of the parts that keep boring out and wearing away are aluminum. Well, I've got a machinist that I've worked with before. You remember when we broke the cutter, he made the, uh, the, cock, the pen. Uh, yeah. I'm going to take the parts out to him and see if I can't have these parts made out of iron. Uh, it shouldn't... Yeah, he should be able to. He should be able to. I, when I don't know if I do that, if it's going to put too much weight on the carriage or whatever else. You better do it soon because there's not going to be many machinists left in this country soon. <laughs> and they're not going to be able to get binders pretty soon. So. No. Uh -oh. <laughs> no. Right, looking looking like toilet paper might become scarce again. <laughs> yeah, here we go all over again. <laughs> this one is the new game is a sixth level dung farmer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Do what? Max character is a six year old dung farmer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's, it. That, that's it for us today. We apologize for these technical difficulties. We're going to work this out because I want to get, uh, I'm going to get Davis on here more often and we're going to get more guests on here. And this is kind of a test run for a couple of things. One, to get Chuck back into running the Twitch for us and also to get Davis and make sure Davis's equipment is working. Clearly his, his is, mine is not. <laughs> so, so Chuck and I'll get all that worked out uh, before we do Ask Me Anything on Tuesday. Um, but uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up for the stream. Thanks, Davis, for coming out of the woodwork and joining us. And we'll get Davis on here more often. Yeah. <laughs> What's the prime attribute for a dumb farmer? We're going to leave that one for Davis for the next year in terms of the trade. <laughs> all right, Chuck keeps giving me the finger. Hold on just a second. What are we doing, Chuck?
Let's do it. So we're going to raid Dwarven Forge, if you can hang out for just a second. Uh, they're doing a hashtag fixed Chuck now. So <laughs> Thanks, Great Pay, for coming out. Real long shot, Commander, Willie, everybody, thanks for coming out. The raid begins in about seven seconds. We will see you guys this weekend, and uh, y'all have a good and safe weekend, and we'll see you next week.